So we have been discussing about Laplace transform for the past few days uh, on Monday and Wednesday. So today I'm going to talk about the region of convergence, properties of region of convergence of Laplace transforms, right? And as we have discussed in the, uh, in the previous class that even though two signals can have the same Laplace transform, uh, they would be uh, they would have distinct region of convergences. So therefore, the region of convergence is actually an important part of Laplace transform. And we have seen several examples in the previous class about this uh, concept. So let's think a little bit about what are the different properties of region of convergence for Laplace transform. So let me start with the first property, which we have all seen that um, ROC is a strip parallel to the J omega axis in the S plane. Okay, so we'll have Laplace transform. So I'm sorry, we'll have the region of convergence, which will look like this. This is my ROC. So it's a strip. I mean, this could be infinity, like this could be infinity, or this could be minus infinity, or it could just be a strip in between the two infinities. Uh, but it's always going to be a strip, and this strip is going to be parallel to the J omega axis. This is my J omega axis and it's going to be parallel to the imaginary axis or J omega axis in the S plane. And we have seen all the examples that we have seen, we saw that this holds and the way we typically represent such a strip, which is parallel to the J omega axis, will typically represent this by um, A is less than, no, A is less than real part of S less than B. Now B could be infinity, A could be negative infinity, or A and B could be some, um, some numbers, some real numbers. So this is a strip. Now you might ask, why is this true, right? Why, why should the region of convergence be parallel to the J omega axis? Let's go back to our discussion. So the Laplace transform of XT is actually Fourier transform of XT e raised to minus sigma t for some value of sigma. Not some value of sigma xt at s and s is sigma plus j omega. Now this Fourier transform will exist if absolute value of xt e raised to minus sigma t dt is less than infinity. So if this condition is satisfied, only then Fourier transform is going to exist for xt e raised to minus sigma t. So as soon as a sigma is in the region of convergence, because this, this integration makes sense, this integration is finite, then everything, this is my sigma, sigma plus j omega one, sigma plus j omega two, sigma minus j omega one and so on. So all the points on this line, which is uh, parallel to the j omega axis and crosses through sigma, all of those lines are part of the region of convergence. So that's the reason why the region of convergence is a strip, which is parallel to j omega axis in the S plane.
Okay. Let's talk about the second property. So poles do not belong to the region of convergence. So if you have a rational transfer, a rational uh, Laplace transform and you calculate the pole, the pole cannot be in the region of convergence. And the reason is because X at a pole is actually infinity. So therefore, pole cannot be in the region of convergence. Remember, poles are poles are roots of denominator. So, if uh, if you evaluate x at a pole, because the zero is in the denominator, x of pole becomes infinity, and therefore, pole cannot be in the region of convergence, straightforward proof. Let's look at the third uh, property. If xt is finite duration, and absolutely integrable, then ROC is the entire complex plane. So if I have a signal that looks like this, so this is my XT, this is my T, so it's a finite duration signal, um, which is non-zero only between T1 to T2. And it is absolutely integral, is integrable. So if you take the integral of absolute value of xt dt, it's, uh, it's less than infinity. In this case, the region of convergence would be the entire complex plane. Let's move to the fourth property of the region of convergence. So if XT is right-sided signal and sigma naught belongs to the ROC, the region of convergence, then then all values of h such that real part of s is greater than sigma naught is part of the region of convergence. It's a subset of the region of convergence. Let's say my signal XT looks like this. This is my signal. And here is my S plane, the real, real plane, the real axis and the imaginary axis. And let me make an assumption that 
this line sigma naught is part of the region of convergence. Then because by virtue of the fact that this XT is a right-sided signal, turns out that this entire portion is part of the region of convergence. I think there should be an equal to here. This property will have a significant impact in the field of control theory. So if you take 3551, this particular property is sort of implicitly used in the entire course of 3551. The reason is because control systems are inherently causal. And if a causal, if you have a causal system, then the impulse response is going to be a right-sided signal because uh, in a causal system, your impulse response will always be non-zero after time t equals to zero. And in those cases, the region of convergence is always going to be, going to extend all the way to plus infinity. So it has some use, some not some, uh, it's actually an implicit uh, um, part of the entire course of control theory. So that's why it's, a, it's an important property. So the fifth property basically mirrors the fourth property. So XT is left-sided. signal and sigma naught belongs to the region of convergence, then S says that real part of S less than equal to sigma naught is part of the region of convergence. So I have a left-sided signal. and this particular line is part of the region of convergence, then everything here is also part of the region of convergence. Okay. Now let's look at the sixth property. XT is two-sided signal. And sigma naught belongs to the region of convergence. Then ROC is a strip containing sigma naught.
So my XT looks something like this. It, it's it's an integrable signal, but uh, it it's non-zero over the entire real line. <clears throat> and this sigma naught is part of the region of convergence, then there is a strip that looks like this, and the region of convergence would be such a strip. And this strip would contain this uh, line sigma naught, this red line would be con contained within this strip which would be the actual region of convergence. Can you really quickly just scroll back up? I, I need to finish the top line there. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, we are left with two more properties. Let's look at the seventh property. So excess is rational. Then region of convergence is bounded. by poles and or extends to infinity. Further Poles are not part of the region of convergence. I want you to recall the example of xt being e raised to negative b absolute value of t. Okay, so in this case, the region of convergence was bounded by poles. The poles themselves were not part of the ROC or the, the vertical line that contained the poles. They were not part of the region of convergence, but the entire strip without the, without the, uh, the poles, they were part of the region of convergence. Let me go back to my uh, notes. When did we talk about, right, so this was the case. This was the case. So X6 of S was one over S plus P minus one over S minus P. So it had two poles minus P and plus P and the region of convergence was bounded by the poles and it was a strip, but, and the poles were not included. So minus B is strictly less than the real value of the real part of S is strictly less than B. So this was our example six in the previous lecture. Okay, that's the property seven. We have already seen this in the previous lecture. Let's go to property eight. Excess is rational. XT is right sided. Then ROC is the entire half plane 
entire right half plane that is right of rightmost pole. There are too many rights here, so this statement must be right. Okay. So let's say my signal is xt and I look at the Laplace transform and xs turns out to be a rational function of s. And uh, we know that xt is right-sided. So this part is given, xt is right-sided. This is given to us. And the fact that xs is rational, that's given to us. Now, let's look at the region of convergence of this, uh, uh, this Laplace transform. The region of convergence would be the entire right half plane that is right of the rightmost pole. So let's look at what are the right what are the rightmost poles. So these two poles are the rightmost poles. Okay, all the other poles are left of these two poles. So let's draw a a dotted line which is the rightmost pole. Um, which is a, a vertical uh, line, which is parallel to the imaginary axis and it passes through the rightmost pole. Then the region of convergence is entire right half plane that is right of the rightmost pole. So this is the entire right half plane that is right of the right, rightmost pole. And this is all part of the region of convergence. So the region of convergence contains zeros, that's fine. It's not a problem, but it would not contain the poles of X of S. A similar statement holds even for the left-sided uh, signals. So if XS is rational and XT is left-sided, then ROC is the entire left half plane that is left of the leftmost pole. So you can just replace right with left and everything will make sense. The entire statement will make sense. So from the controls uh, viewpoint, and because I'm a controls person, I know more about the controls part than some of the other areas of ECE. From the controls perspective, these right-sided signals and the rational excess, uh, rational Laplace transforms and this, this region of convergence, which is right half plane of the rightmost pole, uh, this is the most important sort of fact that you need to remember from the controls perspective. But I'm assuming that in signal processing and maybe in other areas, these left-sided signals are also useful. I just don't know of an example because I've studied more control theory than signal processing. Any questions so far on the region of convergence? Okay, let's move on to properties of Laplace transform. So like when we had studied the Fourier transform, we went through several properties of Fourier transform, which was additivity, uh, uh, convolution, multiplication, and so on and so forth. 
Now, it turns out that many of those properties are also enjoyed by Laplace transform. Now, of course, this is not a news because um, uh, Laplace transform is basically Fourier transform of signal multiplied by an exponentially decaying or exponentially growing term. So, so many of those properties are actually inherited by Laplace transform as well. The only important caveat now is that the region of convergence may differ. So in the Fourier transform case, we didn't have to worry about the region of convergence because there was no uh, requirement of that sort in that particular, in the case of Fourier transform, because XT was integrable, assumed to be integrable. Now in this case, in the Laplace transform, we have to be worried about the region of convergence. Um, so here is the, the various properties of Laplace transform. I'm not going to derive it because the derivations are essentially the same as uh, the ones were Fourier transform. And uh, the region of convergence part is something that you probably have to think a little bit, but it's not that difficult. So we have three signals here with the uh, Laplace transform as XS, X1S, and X2S, and the region of convergence is denoted by R, R1, and R2. So linearity, the first property, very obvious property. Uh, if you take a linear sum of two signals, the Laplace transform gets added in the same proportion and the uh, region of convergence is the intersection of the two region of convergences. This was something we talked about in lecture 31. Now the second property, which is time shifting, uh, I'll make this uh, table available to you so you don't have to copy down the whole table. So let's just go through all these properties one by one and then move on to the yeah. next topic. Is this table also in our textbook? It's there in textbook. This is table 9.1 from textbook. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the second property is time shifting if you shift the time axis of the signal, so x of t minus t naught, then the Laplace transform will be e raised to negative s t naught times x of s. And the region of convergence is the same as the region of convergence of the original signal itself. And the proof of this result would come from the change of variables uh, that we are all very familiar with now. The third property, let's shift the signal in S domain. So we have E raised to S naught T XT. So XT is my original signal. I multiply it by a E raised to a complex number times T. Then the Laplace transform would be transformed in, in, in the following way, X of S minus S naught. So S naught is the complex number that you have used to multiply the signal by. And in this case, the region of convergence which would shift by a negative S naught factor. Now time scaling. So let's assume that we scale the time, then the Laplace transform will get compressed in the following way. And this would be a scaled region of convergence. So S is in the region of convergence if S of S over A is in the in R. Conjugation is um, X star of S star. The region of convergence remains unchanged. Convolution, we have two signals. We convolve it uh, in the Laplace domain. They get multiplied. And this, and this property, as I mentioned, is a very, very important property which is why Fourier transform and Laplace transform is so famous within the EC curriculum. And that's because of this convolution in time domain is multiplication in the Laplace domain or con con multiplication in the Fourier domain. And in this case, the region of convergence would be the intersection of the two region of convergences. Um, differentiation in time domain is uh, multiplication by S in the Laplace domain. Differentiation in S domain is multiplication by time in the, lap, in the time domain with a negative sign. And again, the region of convergence remains the same. Same thing in the integration in time domain is division by S in the Laplace domain. And the region of convergence is R, the right half plane 
of the complex plane. So the real part of S must be greater than zero and intersected with R, the original region of convergence. Okay, so these are the properties. We have studied exactly the same set of properties in the context of Fourier, Fourier series, Fourier transform. And wherever you see S, you can replace it with J omega and you will get the, uh, the Fourier transform uh, expressions. So there's no difference, except that in the case of Fourier transform, the region of convergence must contain the J omega axis. And so a lot of these uh, region of convergence discussion becomes useless. because we are only concentrating on the J omega axis in the context of Fourier transform. There are two other important results that you can show in the context of Laplace transform. They are called initial value and final value theorems. Okay, and I want you to um, look at the statement of these theorems very carefully. And again, these two theorems are very, very useful in the context of control systems, perhaps also in the context of signal processing. So if xt is zero for t less than zero, and xt contains no impulses or higher order singularities at t equals to zero. Okay, so two requirements. My xt has to be zero for t less than zero, and xt should not contain any impulses or singularities at t equals to zero. Then, Let me rewrite this expression here. X of zero plus, so the value of X right after zero is going to be limit S goes to infinity S time XS. This is known as initial value theorem. And the proof is covered in 3551. It's not very difficult proof. Uh, you can look up the proof, but it's typically covered as part of the curriculum of 3551. Now let's look at the second statement, the final value theorem. The first condition is the same. XT has to be zero for T less than zero. And the second one is the most important part xt has a finite limit as t goes to infinity. So you have to know upfront that xt has finite limit as t goes to infinity. Okay, that's part of the hypothesis. So if this is the case, xt has a limit, then I can say limit t goes to infinity xt, which is basically x infinity. This is limit s goes to zero. S excess. Okay, so I can, uh, by looking at the Laplace transform and by taking appropriate limit, I can actually tell you what the final value of the signal X looks like. And that's why this is called the final value theorem. Just by looking at the Laplace transform, you can identify what the final value of the signal looks like. This is actually, I, I find it very fascinating that you can actually just look at the signal, look at the Laplace transform and you can tell me what the final value of that signal looks like. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say my X of, yeah, go ahead, question. Uh, would the final value just be like the steady state? This is the steady state, yes. This is the steady state value, that's right. So let's look at a signal, x of t equals to e raised to negative a t u t. a is greater than zero. So in this case, I know that this signal is going to converge to zero. So this goes to zero as t goes to infinity and x of s is one over s plus a. Now 
Now I can look at the steady state value x infinity as limit s goes to zero s over s plus a and we all know that this is equal to zero. So I can compute the steady state value just by looking at the Laplace transform. I don't have to even do the inverse Laplace transform to figure this value, the steady state value. Now let's look at a situation where this does not apply. Let's consider xt equals to e raised to at ut. So this is my example one. This is my example two. Now I know that this particular, let's a is greater than zero. So this signal goes to infinity as t goes to infinity. Okay, so it doesn't have a limit. However, if you compute your x of s, that is one over s minus a. And if you take the limit, s goes to zero, x s s, this is equal to zero. Which is of course not equal to infinity. So for signals that do not have a steady state value, we cannot apply the uh, this uh, result, the final value theorem. Okay, and that's uh, that's part of the hypothesis of final value theorem, right? So xt has to be zero for t less than zero, and then xt has a finite limit as t goes to infinity. Only then you can apply the final value theorem, otherwise you cannot. Let's look at a third example. So this one is going to infinity. Um, and so of course, zero is not equal to infinity, therefore final value theorem does not apply. Let's look at the third example where xt is cos of omega t, in which case my x of s is one over s square plus omega square. Oh, uh, I should put a UT here. Yeah. And there should be S in the numerator. Okay. Now, does this signal converge to something as T goes to infinity? What do you guys think? What does cos omega t converges to as t goes to infinity? So this does it doesn't not, converge. Yeah, it does not converge. It does not converge. So again, the final value theorem is not applicable, but if you compute limit s goes to zero, um, S multiplied by XS that is actually equal to zero. But then final value theorem does not apply. So FVT does not apply in second example and FVT does not apply in this particular example as well, in the third example as well. So the limit the fact that x of t should have a limit as t goes to infinity is very, very important part of this final value theorem. Okay. 
any questions so far on properties I of have a quick question yes go ahead about example theory if we yes. have a decaying exponential in front of the cosine would would it converge yes then it would converge so if okay. my x of t was e raised to negative a t cos omega naught t u t so this would converge to zero as t goes to infinity in which case fvt applies yeah this is a typical trick question in 3551 you know it comes in assignments or quizzes or whatever uh to test the understanding of your final value theorem so just keep it in mind if you are going to take 3551 okay let's talk about characterization of lti systems using laplace transform So, so far we haven't talked about how you can convert a differential equation into what is known as a transfer function. I'm sure you have learned it in 2050, but we have to formally define it using all the theory of Laplace transform that we have developed so far. Uh, we'll do that very shortly, but let's think about does region of convergence contain any information about important issues like causality and stability of LTI system and it turns out that it does. So let's look at the first property of the LTI system, which is causality. Can we see the region of convergence and talk about causality of the LTI system? So remember H of S is Laplace transform. of impulse response. This H of S is called system function or transfer function. So H of J omega was, remember H of J omega is frequency response. Right, so there are different names, but they all are basically connected to each other. Uh, so as long as you remember the math part of it, it doesn't matter what name you're calling it. So H of S is transfer function or system function and H of J omega is frequency response of the system. So I have an LTI system. I know the transfer function of the LTI system. And I know the associated region of convergence of the LT of the impulse, sorry, of the Laplace transform of the impulse response. Then these are the three conclusions you can draw. So ROC of causal system is a right half plane and that's because because ht is right sided signal Okay, so a causal system's uh, impulse response has to be right-sided signal. It can't be a left-sided signal. Let me write it. HT equals to zero for all T less than zero.
H of S is rational, then causality is equivalent to ROC being right of the rightmost pole, right half plane, okay, right, so many rights, right half plane to the right of the rightmost pole. So if I give you a rational transfer function and I give you the region of convergence, and if the region of convergence is right half plane to the right of the rightmost pole, then the system is causal, then the LTI system is causal. This idea, the second part, was actually alluded to earlier when I was talking about excess being rational. Uh, no, not this, not this one. Uh, Right-sided signal. This is the place where I was. Not this one. Oh, there it is. So if excess is rational, xt is right-sided, then region of convergence is the entire right half plane that is right of the rightmost pole. Okay. So if this is the if H of S has this property, then it means that the system is causal. Okay, so by looking at the region of convergence, it's actually very easy to infer causality of that LTI system. Let's look at stability. Another thing that is used heavily in 3551, stability of LTI systems. So LTI causal system is stable if and only if the real part of poles is less than zero. real part of poles is less than zero. This is the, these are the poles of H of S. We could not have inferred this property using the Fourier transform because there was no concept of pole of a Fourier transform. Uh, sorry, Fourier trans uh, frequency response of H of J omega. There was no concept of that. And, and now that we have uh, understood this Laplace transform business, we can now infer stability of a system just by looking at the poles of the impulse uh, of the system transfer function. So this is for the causal system. This is first property for causal system. The second property is LTI system is stable if and only if J omega axis is part of the region of convergence.
Okay, so two important things, causality and stability, can actually be inferred just by looking at the region of convergence. And in the case of stability, if you know the poles of the system transfer function, you can infer that the system is stable or not stable. One of the most important application of, not application, but one of the most important system that is inherently unstable is human body. So human body is like an inverted pendulum. So when you're standing upright, this is your head, this is your hand, these are your legs. So when you are standing upright, you are actually a inverted pendulum. Like you can be modeled, a human being can be modeled as an inverted pendulum, which is inherently unstable, but our body has developed mechanisms in place to uh, move our body in such a way that we don't really fall off. Now, of course, if you have some some problems, like you know, if, if you have some problems with uh, your inner ears, or if you have some problems with uh, processing in your brain, then you will fall off. Like you will have dizziness or something and you will fall on the ground. And that's because again, we are inherently unstable system. So we'll fall off the ground if our body is not responding to the inputs correctly. Okay. And the reason why our body is unstable, like one way to figure out why our body is unstable is to come up with a dynamical equation for inverted pendulum. And you can ascertain yourself that the poles, one part of the pole is on the, has a positive real part. So actually the inverted pendulum, the transfer function, H of S would be one over S square minus A square. So, the poles are plus minus A, where A is some positive number. And uh, since one of the poles has positive, uh, one of the poles has positive real part, it's an unstable system. Okay. Now the final thing that is parallel to uh, the development in the frequency response of the system uh, or was as follows. So suppose I have a differential equation, summation AK, DKY T over DTK equals to summation BK, DKX T over DTK, K equals zero to M, K equals zero to N. Then you can figure out the Laplace transform y of s over x of s, which is given by summation bk s raised to k over summation ak s raised to k. This is the differential equation governing. Okay, so when you look at the differential equation for an LTI system, you can compute the system transfer function just by look just by using the coefficients of the uh, you know, the kth derivative of y and kth derivative of x. And that's it, you, you have the system transfer in front of you, and then you can use the method of partial fraction or whatever to compute h of t, just like we have done it in the case of uh, Fourier transform and frequency response of the system. So that's all I have for today. Uh, we'll see some examples of uh, LTI systems, the first order and second order LTI systems, study their system transfer function, uh, look at a couple of more properties of uh, Laplace transform, and then move on to the chapter of Z transform. Thank you for your attention. Have a great weekend and see you on Monday next week.